Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Hell is for Children, a Blog Talk Radio program for and by protective mothers with your host, Geerta Franken. So what's a protective mother? A protective mother tries to protect her child or children from their abusive father by many means necessary. Yes, you can call in. Are you ready? Operation Exposed continues. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fourth episode of Hell is for Children. This show is on every Saturday at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, and the call-in number is 347-850-8617. And I'd like to start to thank Bobby Biesinger from World Integrity News Network for providing us with this platform. I have two guests on today, and both could be considered protective mother veterans, as they both have been dealing with the court abduction of their children for many years. And um, one of the guests that I'm going to have on is Coral Anika Thayel, who will tell us the, her story and will discuss in particular the, the, the topics of narcissism, maternal deprivation, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and the effect that abuse has on the lives of protective mothers and their court abducted kids. And also, in particular, I want to talk about what type of healing methods can be of help. Okay, so before I introduce my guests, I would like to express my gratitude to them both in regards to sharing their experiences and, you know, really acknowledge the fact that it takes real courage to tackle these <clears throat> difficult topics. So thank you both uh, for sharing your experience. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Coral to the show. And I'm going to see if she is on. Hi, Coral. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm here. Hi, Coral. Welcome to the show. And thank you so much for being on. Um, I know you've been on uh, multiple radio shows before, and uh, you've been going through uh, court abduction and dealing with uh, being deprived of your children for a very long time. And you've uh, done extensive research into the causes of, um, you know, what, the reason why these fathers uh, do this to uh, the mothers of their children and their own children. Children and uh, I really respect all the knowledge you have gathered and all the insights that you share uh, on social media channels. And uh, I would want us to kind of start with having you share your own story, so we uh, we know a little bit about your situation before we get into these topics. So please go ahead. Thank you. Um, maybe for your guests, I'll introduce them to my website so they can possibly follow also. It's under CoralAnnikaTeal.com. That's C-O-R-A-L-A-N-I-K-A-T-H-E-I-L-L.com. And there's um, many links and resources. There's a resource page of um, many of the articles and books and videos that have assisted me in my healing throughout the years. And uh, my story started basically, I think many of our stories um, from as protective mothers begin in our childhood. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, many of us have been abused and have had um, abusive parents. Uh, many of us have gone through childhood rape, molestation, physical, emotional abuse. And often if we are not provided um, adequate counseling, uh, good mentors, uh, role models. Uh, predators find us at an early age, and uh, we we marry them and have children with them. And then when we wake up and become aware and more conscious, we seek safety. And uh, this is not what they allow. Um, they believe we are a possession. And so um, we go to family court and realize that many of the judges and the people within the court system are no different than the predator, abusive husband that we're seeking safety from. Uh, I sought safety um, first in the fall of 1995, and uh, I sought attorney help um, to report abuse in our home. 
uh, abuse of my children and then um, did report the documented abuse to sheriffs and police. And uh, everything went downhill from there. Uh, the price for my own safety and freedom in March 10th, 1996 was an imposed a natural and unwanted separation from my eight children, including my six month nursing infant. The injustice committed against me, and I'm talking for all protective mothers, it's not just the physical separation. Excuse me. Take your time. So, um, I I totally yes. understand. It's a really intense topic, oh, and yes, uh, you is. know we write about so. it, but sometimes uh, speaking about it is different. Um, yep. Anyway, it's just not this physical separation from our children, but the willful desecration of the mother-child relationship and bond of sacred spiritual and emotional entity. And I do highly recommend Melissa Barnett's uh, excellent article called "The Vengeful Father Syndrome." It's posted at mothersoflostchildren.org, and it goes through many points of what we encounter after this. Um, but basically, my ex-husband and his attorneys uh, did judge, judge shop um, six other judges. Some of them more familiar um, with domestic violence and these issues were um, recused, and um, Judge uh, Albin Norblad, uh, who passed away uh, few years ago, but for 30 years, he uh, took babies and children, took custody away from protective mothers and gave them to abusers, and that was my judge. And even though in court he uh, did say he was leaving my nursing baby and young children with me, um, the unique circumstances I had, I I had been given permission by him to live under an address protection program um, in hiding before the court. They acknowledged the rapes that I had suffered um, during the period I was ill three years before. I'd suffered a physical collapse and partial stroke after a home birth of my seventh child. I hemorrhaged without medical care, and six months later, I collapsed, and I'm not ashamed of that. I am not any different than any human being, but I I reached the end of um, all that I could do and all that I could, I guess my mask fell off also. I think our mask we wear um, when we're abused, uh, often uh, there's there's a moment in time that it comes off. But uh, anyway, the circumstances of this case is the judge had heard from doctors, witnesses, neighbors, um, many people that had been in my life for 20 years, and he acknowledged the abuse. Attorneys knew about the abuse. It was all documented. And... uh, He then said he was leaving my young children with me, but 10 days later, he abruptly removed all of my children. Um, So then it went on, and I was sued eventually for double that I earned. I I ended up living out of my car for three years. Um, I've been in court 45 times in the last 15 years, Um, 45 hours of depositions with a camera in front of your face, um, and very costly with several attorneys, court reporters, um, not anything about me being a good mother, but just um, very humiliating and um, abusive uh, ordeal. Uh, So that's what I've been doing the last 20 years, and basically I spent five years documenting uh, my life story. I listened and viewed all the audio court tapes and videos and deposition tapes and affidavits and uh, put it in my book, um, Bone Shia, Making Light of the Dark, which was first published while I was living out of my car and under incredible court abuse in 2003, and it was republished, and I did add another 10 years of court trauma in 2013, and my book is available for free to those who want to read it at my website. Um, but I, I have concluded by my present circumstances, just from my 20 years history, and seeking safety in the 20 years before of an abusive marriage that was supported within the religious community, that the judicial and religious organizations and people who have aided my former husband, Marty Warner of Independence, Oregon, that they all embrace the same views regarding women and children, that they believe male power is absolute over women and great harm will come to those who question and or defy that power. And I believe this is the mentality that causes and perpetuates abuse. I also believe 
in exposing individuals who aid, support, enable, and condone the criminal and violent behavior of abusers and predators. And it's just as important as exposing the men who have abused women and children. And there's an excellent article um, about flying monkeys is the term they call it, but are you a flying monkey for a narcissist? And uh, in my past, many people, many people, including pastors and elders and you know, just many members within the community have aided my ex-husband, my abuser, and the crimes are all documented. But um, that has been, I I think that's a real definite uh, pain that a lot of people have difficulty healing from. It's not just the abuse, but it's the people who aid our abusers. It is incredibly painful. We have also uh, uh, Karen Huffer, who um, actually yes. labeled the court-ordered abuse as a legal abuse uh, yes. syndrome. Um, and that's really important for the listeners who are not in our situation to understand, is that it's not just the abuse that we have suffered from our ex-husbands or ex-boyfriends or ex-partners, or that we might currently be experiencing, but it is the court and child family services who uh, who continue the abuse uh, through the system. Uh, and this is so devastating. It's uh, You have the evidence, you present the evidence, and instead, uh, instead of that evidence being heard, uh, it's used against you. It's turned around. It's like we are dealing with a world uh, full of uh, narcissists. It's, uh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, and, yeah. and at my website, I do have a link called Maternal Alienation Fact Sheet. It's at the top. It's really easy to find uh, for all the protective mothers and family and friends and people who research this topic. It's an excellent um, page to educate yourself about maternal alienation and what is going on. But sadly, even 200 years ago, there was a system of legal slavery that allowed the ownership of human beings as if they were livestock and children were ripped away from their mothers with as little consideration as separating a calf from a cow. And now that is what we have been experiencing now for decades in our family court system. And uh, for many people, um, I don't know if they know this, but many mothers who seek safety from abuse are routinely prohibited from having even the most basic contact with their own children, not because they were unfit parents, but because they were outspent, outrepresented, and outmaneuvered in a court atmosphere not prepared to understand the needs of families dealing with domestic violence. Mm-hmm. For many people who will ask, you know, they may not understand. I, I, for the last 20 years, when people hear that I lost my children, I was a good nurturing mother for 24-7, you know, round the clock. And I protected my children, even with my body, from abuse. I had no help, and I was being dragged through eight various Christian-type cults. Um, I was isolated, and uh, I had no no people to go to. But, um, you know, many people ask you why, you know, why, why did you stay? And uh, this is why I've had, I've received hundreds of letters, sadly. And I've even written U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley, Senator from Oregon, and I met with him in D.C. and handed him my book, handed him a 20-page document that detailed and outlined the 20 years of court abuse I've suffered. And this is a story that it's repeated throughout the world, not just me, but I spoke to about all of us protective mothers, but I shared with him in person, women from Oregon and around the world tell me after reading my story, reading my book, they have decided to stay, to stay in domestic violence, that it would be safer and more sane than yeah, that's that I, I and others have done. And so I share, even in my book, I say that battered women may lose their babies and children, their homes, their friends, and their livelihood. Survivors of childhood abuse will often even lose their families. Rarely does society recognize the dimensions and the long-lasting effects of this reality to the victim. And after an over a decade of personally seeking assistance from advocacy groups on a local, state, and national level, the advocacy system as it is, has offered me nothing. 
Exactly and this is why we uh, this is why we need to talk about it, right? Because maybe there's something we can do to finally start uh, uh, such support. We we really need, um, um, for example, some kind of uh, housing and financial assistance and psychological assistance for for victims uh, yeah. of narcissistic abuse. And and there's so many of us. There's thousands of us. And you know, besides Thanks the fact thousands. that you know <clears throat> that that people yeah. ask you like, why did it happen to you? This is what you know, that's just why what people ask me as well, uh, and we are explaining that here on this radio show. I also want to point out that the people who are standing by and watching this occur to us and our children, and not doing, they're not doing anything. They are also responsible for what is happening to our children and to us. There is no such thing as 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 doing nothing. If you are doing nothing when you know that this is going on, then you are responsible for the human rights inflictions that are uh, occurring to our children and to us as as protective mothers. So I really want to uh, wake people up, uh, family members, friends, uh, people who know our children, people uh, who are aware of the situation. Please uh, act for our children and act for us. Don't just stand by and do nothing. Uh, You know, you're responsible. If you don't do anything, then you are contributing to these human rights violations. I'll also share that even the movie Spotlight that won awards, and it's an incredible, incredible movie. But even in that situation with the Catholic Church priest abuse, people just turned a blind eye, um, no different than in the Holocaust, um, and with Catholic Church abuse and with protective mothers. Um, it's it's just many individuals, they just prefer not to hear even in our situation, mm-hmm. the story of how cultured people turned a blind eye to consenting to the court-sanctioned kidnapping of children through our family court system. And mostly yeah, and not, and, of our and, society, and, they, re- mm-hmm. they just remain silent and uh, they right. blame us. And, and I think, you know, even within our religious systems, it's often, you know, even at a young age, we are taught shame, blame, guilt, and fear. And sadly, um, I believe a lot of our societies conditioned and brainwashed. But as far as um, resources, too, you can go to my website, and there is a huge resource list. Um, There's one that I posted from the Mothers of Lost Children site, um, and I have listed many articles written by professors and doctors and professionals. There's books, movies, videos, uh, for anybody that wants to educate themselves on this topic. Uh, Mm -hmm. There are many resources. Yes, yeah, so the, your website is really an excellent uh, wealth of information is on there. And uh, what, I, what I'd like to add to what you were saying is, uh, you know, I haven't had any contact with my daughter since May 2015. Uh, and I don't think you have any contact with your children either. Is that correct? No, it's been 17 years. Um, wow. Basically what happened, I lost custody of my children. And... Uh, Uh, I was given visitation every two weeks, and I had a nursing infant, so I did go to a hospital, and I rented a breast pump, and I went to stay with a friend, and later collapsed and went into shock. I had two wonderful friends. One of them, um, her name was Debbie Custis, who for the first week slept in front of the door, uh, the place I was staying, because I kept getting up and wanting to go get my babies. I was just in shock. I could not understand what had happened and why, and today... 20 years later, I still do not understand what had happened and why. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I did write a 300-page book outlining what, uh, just the details of what is going on. But um, Mm -hmm. I I understand the society that I I was going to share that, yes, I um, got to see my baby. I had twin daughters that were very um, sadly brainwashed and conditioned to... uh, I, I, uh, to term it, they watched over me. Um, my ex-husband, when they were in the third grade and ongoing for six years, had me homeschool my children. We then moved into a huge farm area in Polk County, Oregon. Um, where there, I was very far and away and isolated. My ex-husband at that time worked for Hewlett Packard, but he abused many women in the workplace. Uh, some had come to my court case and filed affidavits um, 
this was very well known and widely known, but um, this was a woman who helped me hide my van at night, her and her husband. They brought me food while I was hiding in motel rooms with my young children. Um, anyway, when I did get visitation, the abuse did not stop. Mm-hmm. And that's what I, I find um, people wonder, well, you know, what was wrong with you? You got visitation. Well, I was sexually assaulted soon after on the property. I was not his wife anymore, but even to visit my children, most often he and his mother would not even let the children out of the house. So here was mother trying to pick them up on a court-ordered visitation day, and I didn't get to see them and eventually had to drive away, or there was much, uh, just much abuse. And um, my children were being taught that I was evil, wicked, and immoral for divorcing. The church at that time knew a lot of the documentation, but uh, they didn't believe in divorce. These were Baptist and evangelical churches in the um, Oregon area that supported my my husband at the time and to date. And uh, they then supported him because I was evil. They helped brainwash. They, that's what they told my children anyway. And my children would come to see me and they loved me. And they would then talk about the abuse that was going on in the home. And then they'd also be told you know, telling me that I was evil, wicked, and moral, and they weren't to listen to a word I said, and that they would, they were told that they'd understand when they got older. And this went on for a couple years, and I understood that my children were being abused because they loved me. They wanted to run away. One became suicidal. I told them not to run away. That was dangerous. I, my doctors and mentors and I, all, you know, talked about this, and they said when I was strong enough as an act of love to my children. And I'm not, I'm just only talking about my situation. Everybody has huge dynamics of various layers. So this would not possibly right, be right for each person. But for me, I chose mm-hmm. to protect myself. I no longer wanted to be sexually assaulted. I no long, longer wanted to participate in abuse. I no longer wanted to see my children being abused because they loved me. And I went under an address protection program. I legally changed my name to Heal. And uh, that didn't work out well either. When Once I left the state, there was a stack of mail. Um, and for ongoing, I was in court. I'd have to drive 12 hours, you know, every other week just to come to court. Um, even a year later, he had said I had made disparaging comments about him in the community, which I hadn't even been in the state, you know, for a long time. And um, I was threatened not to write my story by my ex-husband and his attorney. I actually have the tape recording of them saying that and that they would do more harm to me in court if I shared my story. So I just felt Mother Earth would open up uh, if I did not speak the truth and and share what was going on. But it became highly multi-layered with the district attorneys even helping my ex-husband um, with me reporting crimes again and the district attorney dismissing them. Um, my case has the layer of being raped by my abuser, my, my ex-husband, before I sought safety. And this happens to many women as a form of control. But I was physically incapacitated and helpless for 20 months. I was exercised for demons left at halfway houses with rats and lice and ex-cons um, in, the ghetto of, in the ghetto of Portland area uh, to be harmed, they said, for God to break me. Um, there was just a lot of religiosity and um, a lot of harm and abuse in the name of God. And uh, doctors just are amazed I am alive. But I am my baby. So um, am I. Great. So am I, Coral. <laughs> my, <that> baby, <laughs> the baby, my, my baby was taken from me, and then I was ordered even eventually twice the amount I earned um, for child support. And even many of us protective mothers, we said there should be a website called just it, the bizarre things judges do, and it would just be unbelievable. But I have all these documents. I mean, judges have sued me for twice that I make, even while I was living out of my car. My case was taken to the Oregon State of Appeals while living out of my car, fully disabled, fully destitute, and then my ex-husband and his attorneys were trying to sue me for another 50000 Then they wanted to order me state-ordered um, visitation with my children, and it was a decision I made. I mean, I, I know some women who've been mothers for years, um, they participate in that for some contact, but for me, just knowing the circumstances, I said, I'm not mentally ill, I'm not a criminal, and I will not disrespect myself and participate in this. But eventually, a year later, the case got dismissed, but I 
at that time I was trying to go to college. I was living out of my car, working several jobs. I was getting straight A's. I was working toward a degree for a couple of terms, but I had to drop out. I had three court cases and, and a brief to write for the Oregon State of Appeals. So things became more and more bizarre. And at that same time, I was in 2003, I was actually living in Oregon because of all the ongoing court cases. And I, my son, who was 16 at the time, he's now 28, but um, one of my older sons, Joshua, uh, received my email from a cousin of his. They had read my book and um, gave my email to him, and he wrote me for a few months. Uh, we communicated five or more times a day. That was not a court order yet that I wasn't allowed to email, so I did communicate with him. And he asked me to come to his football games because he was a football captain. And I said, well, I don't have visitation contact. I, I wish I could. It costs tens of thousands of dollars to do so, but I will be there. I just am not able to talk to you, but I'll be honored to be at your games. And I did go to his game. Um, he ran off the field and hugged me and asked if we could go to dinner, wanted to see me. And within days, I received contempt orders. I was sued. A woman judge from Astoria, Oregon, Judge Paula Brownhill, I'd like to mention their names. <laughs> They've been involved. She then signed a court order forbidding me to ever contact my children, write them, email them, send them gifts, contact them see them or contact them to a third party. So that was 2003. And so after that, I, was, I, wasn't, um, I didn't get to write my children. So since then, 13 years ago, I don't, I'm sure they've not been told what happened, but um, even through letter, I, I just disappeared out of their life. Although my book this is that every outrageous. Library, it's well, outrageous. It's you know, I want to I also point out that, that you know, when, when someone's on death row for killing someone, inmates, felons on death row, get they have visitation rights with their children. But we, as protective mothers who have no criminal records and have just tried to protect our children from abuse, are uh, told that we cannot have any form of contact with our children. And that is just the grossest human rights violation yeah. I have ever heard of. It's it's outrageous. Let's bring well, on uh, to be sued even yeah. for your son hugging you. I mean, I thought, well, I could mm -hmm. walk away, but that would be bizarre and uh, outrageous. So, yeah. Yes, yes, you have another guest. Yeah, let's let's bring in uh, Susie. I have her on the line here, and let's have her uh, tell us her story, and then I suggest that the three of us will talk about. Uh, these topics of, of narcissism and maternal deprivation and the post-traumatic stress that we all suffer and our children suffer as well and get to the cause of all of this and then uh, talk about how you are still standing, Coral, <laughs> and how Susie is still standing how, and how I am still standing, how we do that because that might be of help to the protective mothers who are currently listening to the show or to the recording of the show. So let me bring on Susie. Uh, Susie, let's see. Susie, can Hello. you hear me? I can hear you. Hi fine, there. Hi. Hi. It's so good to finally yeah. speak with you. I know. We've, we've yeah. known each other for over a year, and uh, we, but we've never talked to each other. We've always uh, con uh, communicated uh, through social media, so I'm so happy to finally hear your voice. <laughs> me too. Me too. And hello to Coral, too. Thank you so much for sharing everything, Coral. It's an intense story uh, that Coral just told us, and uh, right. I kind of want to uh, hear your story as well, because uh, you are also uh, a veteran, as I call it. Uh, you've been in this for a long time, and you've been through a lot, and you're still standing as well. So, you know, tell us uh, uh, your story and, 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 you know, what's what's happening to your children at the moment. Go ahead. Sure, sure. Glad to do that. Well, my former husband and I were together from 1986 through 2005, the year we were divorced. We had two children. They were six years apart. We had a boy and a girl. My ex-husband was diagnosed a sociopath in 2004. That same year, I learned he was sexually attracted to pre -pub prepubescent girls. He had disclosed his sex addiction to me at some point during the marriage. However, I don't know if he'd always had a sexual attraction to little girls or if it had escalated to that point. 
after decades without any treatment. Either way, he hid it well from me as I was clueless, and so this content was inadvertently discovered on our home computer by a family friend. Um, in 1995, the year I received an inheritance, he stole my identity. I did not learn of this until 2008, three years post-decree. He stole from my inheritance and used my social security number to acquire credit cards using my personal information. He then used an alias with my credentials to access child pornography and other illegal obscene internet content, again learned of by me in 2008. Additionally, he became abusive and violent toward me and the children during our marriage. He threatened to sue me for sole custody of our children during our divorce unless I complied with his property settlement terms, which I later learned were completely fraudulent. I did comply, and in return, I was designated the residential parent of our two children and had a joint custody arrangement with him. My children and I attended therapy, and we worked on our recovery from the traumatic effects of the marriage and the divorce for about two years. We enjoyed a two-year reprieve from abuse, as my ex-husband was distracted by a um, newer relationship he had with his fiance, He was engaged just after our divorce, I believe, several months later. The abuse and violence commenced once again after that two-year reprieve, Gurdy. Um, within a few months, he filed an emergency sole custody action at an ex parte hearing, and he took sole possession of our children. During that trial, my young daughter made her first sexual abuse allegation against him. I was scapegoated, and sole custody was immediately awarded to him, our abuser. So I was blamed. Um, I was rendered um, mentally an unknown mental impairment that posed an imminent danger to our children. I was then given minimal supervised visitation, kids, and we all began to deteriorate. My children were not allowed to take any of their possessions from our family home that they were raised in to their new residence with the father. They were ages 15 and 9 at that point. My children were abused, neglected, and even deprived of food. My son lost 25 pounds in the first six months while with his father. My daughter was punished for up to 12 hours a day for consistently stealing food because she was hungry. In the eighth month after my ex got custody, my daughter made an additional eight sexual abuse allegations against him. Once again, even though I had only supervised visits and my phone calls with my daughter were monitored, I was again scapegoated and accused of coaching her. During the so-called investigation, my daughter was placed with my ex-husband's fiance after being removed from his care and his custody. She ultimately recanted her sexual abuse allegations. I'm not sure if she was pressured by the fiance that was not a safe, unbiased environment to place her in and um, was kind of lost at that point. After that, um, after she recanted, I was denied all but minimal phone contact with my children for more than one year. My daughter was 11 years old when I was able to see her again. She was nine when I lost her, and she was sexually acting out in my presence. She also pushed me away when I went to hug her, and unfortunately, I'm very saddened to say that this has continued. To make a long story short, here's the outcome, basically. Um, I was legally disabled from post-traumatic stress disorder and depression in 2011, and eventually became homeless as well. Um, luckily, I found a transitional um, housing environment and atmosphere, and ha I've had intensive therapeutic services with this program since 2013. At this point, since March of 2014, I went back to college, and I intend to get my master's in social work as soon as I'm done, I expect to graduate this June. Um, my goal is to help others in my position, and I pray to God I can help their children as well. My daughter is now 16. When she left, she was a gifted student. She was confident, happy, healthy, and just a dynamite person. I had always been her primary caregiver since her birth, and we shared a special bond. 
She is now emotionally disabled and in a special day therapy school. She has spent the last four years depressed, suicidal, self-harming, and has been frequently hospitalized for multiple problems. She is also using drugs. I visit her regularly when she is in the hospital, but other than that, it appears she has detached from me. I still have a lot of hope for her, though, and I'm here when she is ready. I, I pray to God that one day she comes home. My son, now 22, is a miracle. We are still very close, and now that he is home from college, we spend a great deal of time together. I'm thrilled to tell you that he has been accepted into medical school, Gertie, starting July of this year, and I'm so proud of him. I never thought I would survive the trauma of losing my children and being left powerless to provide any form of comfort to them let alone save them from years of what I refer to as torture. Um, I am so glad I did survive, though. Um, And I just want to thank everyone for listening to my story, and thank you for having me on, Gertie. Well, thank you for sharing that story and, 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 you know, having the courage to share that, because I know it's it's difficult and, and, you know, it's intense. And uh, what I really, you know, admire uh, both in you and in Coral is that you have moved on from the devastation into and, and transforming the experience into, um, you know, going after for a degree in, uh, in in social service. It's amazing, you know. Uh, if you can pull that off, then it means that you just have an enormous amount of strength and uh, faith, um, and also uh, that you're able able to uh, transform the experience into being helpful for other people. Um, and I can only hope that your daughter uh, at some point is able to do the same, you know, and that she can look at you and see, you know, if my mom can overcome this, then I can do this too. And um, you know that, you know, you, you are all both, uh, you know, in my prayers all the time. And, you know, we need to help each other to uh, make sure that she makes it through okay as well. Uh, I know that, um, that it's there's you have a lot going on with her right now. I, I know she was missing yesterday, for example. Um, there, there's a right. lot of issues going on with her, but, um, you know, we can only hope that at some point uh, she has the courage herself to um, to share what has happened to her and to, to get the help that she needs and, and feel that she's in a trusted environment to actually share what's happening with her um, and, you know, to, to expose uh, what's happening because um, all this brainwashing and suppressing is just so incredibly unhealthy and damaging to, to her psyche right. and to her development, you know, and for you mm. to have to be a witness of that is also really, uh, really hard and it just drags on the trauma, just drags rags on for for you this way as well and uh you know i just i, I just wish you both peace the, the, the peace that you finally deserve and um what's also really remarkable in your situation is that your son is doing so well and i i really hope that for all the protective moms that are listening that that's also um, a sign of hope, you know, it, it, it's, it's not a guaranteed negative outcome for all children. Some children do understand what has happened to them and they do make it through. So um, you kind of have both ends of the spectrum happening with your children, which is, uh, which is interesting because it's both from, you know, you're, you're the mom and they're both your children and have both gone through the same thing. So um, yeah, it all depends on how the child is processing what has happened to them. And, uh, and you know, one of the things, like I said earlier, that I want to talk about during the show is how can we be of uh, the best type of support to our children uh, once they um, are able to, um, you know, start removing themselves from the uh, abusive situation. So let's bring uh, Coral back in and let's talk about uh, um, the reasons for this, uh, for nursing narcissism, what, what that really is, uh, and how it manifests uh, itself. And Coral, can you hear me? I, I've put you back yes, on. I had you yeah. on. Okay. Yeah. I had you on mute for a while. So, um, Coral and Susie, you're both on right now. <laughs> and, um, so what I kind of want to initiate is, uh, a discussion about narcissism. Uh, I know my ex has been diagnosed with narcissism and, 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 uh, histrionic personality disorder. What, what are those type of disorders and how do they manifest? 
Coral. Yeah. Oh, go, did you want to go ahead, Susie? No, no, go ahead, Coral. Oh, okay. I, I know you're an expert on this. Oh, no. <laughs> I Actually, uh-huh. when I thought safety, I did not know terms such as narcissism, sociopath. I did not know what domestic violence meant. I did not know what a domestic violence shelter was. Somebody gave me a, um, a phone number and put it in my hand and said I needed to call. <laughs> and I didn't even know I had had those things happen to me. But um, for me, and just looking back at my background and all the people that are helping the person that has been, you know, continuing the harm for several decades. Um, And just in short, for me, I just see a person who doesn't think or feel or have any empathy or compassion and that it is all about for attention for them and for them to um, control those possessions, I, I think, for many, some men that are narcissistic, um, we are possessions. I was just chattel, and the children are possessions, and it is to feed, to feed them and, and their life. We are not people. So to take a baby from a, nurse, a nursing baby from a mother, that did not bother the, uh, my ex-husband at all. It was just a part mm-hmm. of keeping, um, keeping all his empire so he didn't even know what to do do with the baby he asked the person that was dropping off for the court order what would I do what do I feed it he thought I would um, come back but I knew I'd be dead and so my choice was I just obeyed court orders and uh, Dr. Clarissa Estes writes a beautiful book um, Women Who Run With the Wolves and I highly suggest that book for all protective mothers, and it's a good book for men, too. It's very healing. But she writes in her book, If our lips don't speak it, our bodies will scream it. It's a beautiful quote about abuse. But she also talks about just the soul-crushing pain we go through when we have to obey our society's dictates. We obey court Mm -hmm. orders. We will die. Mm -hmm. I feel a great part of me died in 1996. Mm -hmm. I obeyed court orders. But um, I think, too, as I said at the beginning of the program, it's the flying monkeys, the people who the narcissist in, employ for them to do even more harmful things to us. Um, even my adult children have written me hate letters through the years. They're deeply, um, uh, they're into legalistic, fundamental Christianity. They only see things through one prism um, that I divorced, which is evil in their eye and the theology of what they adopted. They do not believe it was evil for me to be harmed and abused, or them either. But um, the hate letters, um, they were taught that. And they sh- certainly didn't believe that before I left. But um, there's so many great articles on narcissism. One of my favorites is the one, Are You a Flying Monkey for a Narcissist? You can Google that. Um, it's also at my site, but that does talk to the people that are helping, helping the, our p- perpetrators, our predators. And, mm-hmm. uh, even for my adult children now, they've been helping my predator. And they even go to court with him. My son-in-law write hateful notes up on newspaper articles about my story. They've never met me. They've never talked to me. I'm sure they've not gone to the court and read a two file, but they are helping to further abuse me. Many of them work in mm. Christian ministries and with troubled children, but they support domestic violence and condone child abuse and molestation and rape. And I have deep concerns about that. And I do believe um, a majority of our society have been raised in the church, and I I do have concerns um, just that our church is not caught up with all of the epidemic of domestic violence, right. rape, child abuse, molestation in our society. One in three girls will be, there's different statistics on this. I, I have a feeling it's more one in two girls will be raped by the age of 18. Some of the statistics, excuse me, statistics are one in four boys, but I believe a lot of it's half of our society because I spoke to thousands of child abuse, rape victims, and none of them reported the crimes because they were children and the people that were in their life were family members who did not help them. So 
I'm just sharing mm-hmm. that the church does help groom a lot of the thinking processes in our society, and uh, they are not very educated on this topic or maybe don't want to be. Some of them support the absolute submission of women, and it doesn't matter what we are having to submit to. And that's what's my It goes beyond the church. Years. Yeah, it goes beyond the church as well, because in in my case, uh, uh, my my ex is not uh, connected to any church, but um, he presents himself in a very charming way, and uh, he presents himself as a hippie and a Zen Buddhist, and and people just go for that, you know, they just... uh, they just believe that mask. And, 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 and that's a really important thing to point out, I think, for the narcissist, because I fell for that too. For for four years, I was in a relationship. I was married to this man, and I didn't really understand uh, what was going on. Uh, I noticed behaviors that I didn't understand. And, and later, um, someone handed me a book. Uh, it was called Why Does He Do That by Lundy Bancroft. Mm-hmm. And yes. once I read that book, my eyes opened. I was like, oh, my God, I, I don't even really know who I'm married to. And this is when the, the, the reality started to unfold because I started to confront him um, with, with the things that were happening. And, uh, you know, once I pulled off that mask, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 vi- the domestic violence uh, escalated and uh, thank God he never uh, beat me or anything like that. It wasn't physical, but it was pure um, psychological and emotional abuse. Um, mm-hmm. So that's something also to point out. I and Susie, add, in your um, case... Uh, and, oh, go ahead. Right. Now, Here's I just want to ask... Book on, um, by, on trauma go. recovery by Judith Herman. Mm-hmm. I might just share one um, paragraph. She wrote that many victims of all sorts um, appreciate. Uh, she says in her book, Trauma Recover- and Recovery by Judith Mm -hmm. Herman. It is very tempting to take the side of the perpetrator. All the perpetrator asks is that bystander do nothing. He appeals to the universal desire to see, hear, and speak no evil. The victim, on the contrary, asks the bystander to share the burden of pain. The victim demands action, engagement, and remembering. And in order to escape accountability for his crimes, the perpetrator does everything in his power to promote forgetting. Secrecy and silence are the perpetrator's first line of defense. If secrecy fails, the perpetrator attacks the credibility of his victim. If he cannot silence her absolutely, he tries to make sure that no one listens. To this end, he marshals an impressive array of arguments from the most blatant denial to the most sophisticated and elegant rationalization. Anyway, that's a... um, that yeah, helps that sums it for up. A lot of victims <laughs> to understand the mm-hmm. suggest that everybody do nothing, and that uh, often yeah. is the case. Or he enlists mm-hmm. the help. But I'll let you go on. With right. That. Well, I was just going to ask Susie how it manifested in her uh, relationship, the narcissism. At which point uh, did you come to realize that? Uh, uh, you were dealing with someone who pretended that he wasn't quite who he right. pretended to be. <laughs> right, right. Well, the facade was very well presented. Um, everyone was fooled. And I didn't really learn about who he really was until the 17th year when I found the child pornography and other obscene content on our home computer. Um, but... um I knew something was wrong because I would become very miserable and um, I wasn't getting any of my needs met, but I was kind of used to that. You know, I grew up in a kind of dysfunctional environment and um, that's probably why I was attracted to him. Um, but anyway, um, so it seemed like it would be it would be cyclic and every Every six months or something, I would, I would become very down, and I knew something was wrong. I There were a couple times when I wanted a divorce, and I was actually went so far as to um, get a lawyer, and he would talk me out of it and everything. And then, um, like I said, I didn't find out until three years after my divorce that he had stolen my identity. It was in 1995. So I learned all of these things. I mean, this was three years post-decree. I learned that he had stolen, I, I, 
I ordered all these past bank records. I learned that he had stolen money from an inheritance I received in 1995. I learned that he was gambling every month. He was withdrawing monies from my account, from an account. And I was pretty much supporting him for about 12 years of the marriage while he was career hopping, going to school, and trying to get into a lucrative um, uh, career, which he eventually did. And um, so anyway, um, he was taking money out of uh, one of my accounts and gambling every month. I had no clue, no clue. And I saw this pornography. I, a friend, a family friend, inadvertently found it, and I confronted him. At first I was like, I was in shock. I, I didn't even believe it was true. And then to find out that he accessed all that under my computer settings using my um, identity with an alias with my name and a different last name. And um, it was all illegal. So if, if, if anybody ever tracked this down, it was all going to point to me. So, you know, I came to the realization that this guy never loved me, that he was using me from the very beginning. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I just couldn't believe that. And then the content I'd seen on the computer was like, I, I just, it, it just floored me. And um, at first I was in denial about it. And I finally, um, I finally confronted him and that's when the abuse, the abuse of marriage, um, really escalated. There was abuse, there was financial abuse, emotional abuse. That's when it became physical. And, um, he he was just out to destroy my credibility, and he used to leave a book lying around the house. It was called Walking on Eggshells, and I went to Florida. I took our young son to Florida on a vacation once, and then the girl that was in there, my daughter was just very, very young. I was reluctant to leave her, but I, we had to get out of the house. He was abusing my son so much, and um, she was watching the baby, and she said that um, he would keep putting this book out on the coffee table and have people over and it would be like an icebreaker or kind of, they would have a conversation about it and he was saying that I was a borderline um, personality that I had a borderline personality disorder and telling all these people this I had no idea mm -hmm. this was going on so by the time of our divorce I had no support um, everyone thought he was a great guy. He's very charming. He's warm. He's likable. I, I even tend to be fooled by him sometimes today, but, um, I, I don't know. So I don't yeah, know. They, they're they able to, they're, they, what they do is they mirror back. Huh? This is the whole, uh, uh, the, uh, the Greek myth of, uh, narcissist, uh, narcissism is, is, is that you, you look in the mirror and you mirror that back. So a narcissist will mirror back, uh, the issues onto their victim. So, uh, it's interesting that you said that, Susie, because that's a, that's what my ex is doing too. He'll he'll tell everybody that I'm schizophrenic. There's 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 no evidence of that. I've been cleared of any mental illnesses, but he'll say that, and people will believe that, right? Because he's got uh, a courts that sign off on all of it. So people think, well, if the court signs off on this, then it must be true. But in fact, the court has uh, diagnosed the opposite. But they're not acting upon the uh, diagnosis, which is interesting because why have custody evaluations and, and diagnose a man with narcissism and histrionic personality disorder and then not act upon it within the uh, custody um, arrangements? It makes no sense at all. Um, right. Yeah. The, one of the things, uh, one of the things that I've noticed is, uh, and this is w w one of the things that I've confronted my ex-husband on when we were still married, is uh, that he was himself the victim uh, of child abuse. And uh, I actually wrote a little thing about it that I want to read out uh, when I was talking about this topic with uh, Melissa Burnett uh, on uh, Mothers of Lost Children, and I stated the ultimate goal of a malignant narcissist is for the victim to commit suicide. They will go through great lengths to achieve this goal, and power is really the only thing through which they arrive pleasure. And often this is the result of lack of attachment with their own mothers during childhood. And so in, in the case of my ex-husband, he, he was abused by his father, and his mother would not protect him from that abuse and would even say to him, um, you know, if you don't do what I say, I'll tell your father about it when he comes home. 
So she actually sided with the uh, the father's abuse in that sense, which is the ultimate betrayal for a child, of course. And so the results for for um, for men who have gone through this as boys is they will go and seek a partner who has a great amount of empathy, and and they pick the empath because they lack the love the empath is capable of. Right? They still unconsciously act out the abandonment from their own mom this way by taking our kids to punish their own mom and thereby they often repeat the cycle of abandonment in our children and so my advice for each and every victim is to stay really thoroughly grounded in contact with their own um, relationship with the divine through spiritual practice and by gaining knowledge about the eternal aspect of the soul. Because in essence, your real true essence, your soul can never be hurt or destroyed. Right? Truth and love have no expiration date. Only karma has uh, an expiration date, right? There's there's a deadline uh, on on what goes around comes around, and that is the beauty of of truth, and it is the key to in- achieving inner freedom from the oppressor, right? And the more that the victim grows on this path of of inner freedom, uh, the harder it becomes for an energy vampire, as I call it, to um, to retain that hold on the victim, right? So. Um, it's really important to surround yourself with people who understand this inside and out and who support you on this. And one of the things that I found in the protective mother scene is just because they, some moms have become victims of narcissism themselves, it does not necessarily mean that they are aware of this energy dynamic yet. And they might fall for the same narcissistic tricks over and over again until they get it. Once they get it and they've seen through the illusion and the mask and then they're really grounded in this truth and thus fully connected to that divine energy, then uh, they're not. Then the narcissist cannot uh, get a hold of them anymore. And in, in in this regard, the narcissist almost plays the role of purifier in the lives of the victim, right? Because you must uh, connect to your faith and to the truth and to love, and and be extremely pure in that and be supportive. Uh, in others in this uh, respect as well, and, bec- and that way the narcissist can never um, get that, uh, retain that hold. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I was going to add um, the consequences of you had asked about narcissism, but for the men who are narcissists and are sociopaths, and who we are in court with often for decades. The consequences, uh, there's a paragraph, uh, Joan Zorza, Z-O-R-Z-A, that is excellent, and it shares what happens. When courts blame victims and fail to hold abusers accountable, they reinforce abusive behavior, subvert justice, disempower the victims, teach children that abusive behavior is permissible and may even be rewarded, and reinforce the cycle of violence. Most batters know They can bring criminal and contempt charges at no expense to the abusers, but they can take an enormous financial and emotional cost on their victims. The result is that many abusive men drag on the litigation and file serious claims openly, acknowledging they are trying to drive their victims into welfare and or into homelessness. Half of all homeless women and children in the U.S. are homeless because of domestic violence. Anyway, those are the results. And uh, right. I was going to share that even before our court hearings, I um, did take six court-ordered psychological exams and passed them all. Many of them were four hours um, in length, and my ex-husband took one, and he failed that. But um, and and they don't look at it. And even in court, it was the abuse was all acknowledged by the judges and attorneys, but that didn't matter. So. Right. Yeah, it kind of goes back to... Go ahead. I was, yeah. Oh, I was going to share um, a quote from a sergeant major who's uh, read my book. And um, I wanted to share that quote here in just a moment. He wrote, um, U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley, Oregon Senator on my behalf. Um, U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley's uh, 
assistant had read my website and many of my articles and had asked me to document my story for for them um, and in, in support Sergeant Major Brian K. Jackson, um, the Marine Corps. He's retired now. He wrote a letter to um, the assistant, Mr. Joel Corcoran and U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley. And he said, as I watch the news today, I see all sorts of other cases pretty similar to Coral Teal's. The same thing that I just... Um, The thing that I just do not understand about our system is why or how can we allow what happened to Coral and is still happening to happen. Some are held against their will, raped, battered, abused, and then glorified, as are the three ladies from Ohio. Guys are considered heroes as a result of the person to make a phone call to the authorities about it. Then we have those in the same situation, he's speaking about protected mothers, and maybe even worse, who are blamed ostracized from society, stripped not only of their children, but of their dignity, ridiculed, and even forced into hiding, and receive absolutely no support from anyone in the justice system, who, by the way, are supposed to be for the, um, by the people, of the people, and for the people. Oh, a powerful, well put. Powerful yeah. thing, Yes. Well, let's take a little break, and uh, when we come back, I want to talk about um, more about this topic and uh, the fact that these human rights violations are, are just uh, not handled in court uh, whatsoever, um, and what we can do about that, and what we can do about it to, um, you know, to remain standing in the midst of this, and to remain strong, and to, you know, see what we can do to. Uh, change the situation so um, let's uh, listen to our theme song and take a little break and uh, before we do that I would like to thank Bobby Biesinger from World Integrity News Network for providing us with this platform and uh, I'll talk to you guys in a little bit and welcome back to Hell is for Children. And once again, thank you to Bobby Biesinger from World Integrity News Network for allowing us to have this platform to talk about these topics. And, uh, you know, if only one mother out there is helped by our show uh, and, and who uh, decides to uh, uh, get to some level of understanding for, of why this is all happening and that she is a victim of narcissism and post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome as a result and will therefore uh, decide not to commit suicide, uh, then you know what? Then this radio show uh, has been helpful, right? That's our aim, to, uh, for, to raise awareness around these topics um, so we all have a good understanding and we're not going to harm ourselves just because others want to harm us. And I have uh, someone on hold here and I want to kind of uh, want to see who this is, someone calling in through the internet. So I'm going to put you on and uh, let's see who this is. Um, hello, you're on the air. Who is holding? Hello, you're on the air right now. Well, I don't hear anything. Hello? Yes. Hi, Gerda. Yes. Hi. Who who is this? Hi, this is Nadia from Facebook. We sometimes chat. I was wondering if I could answer any questions or are my solutions are way too off. Well, our our topic today is purely on uh, narcissism and maternal deprivation and the results that abuse has on mothers and children. I know that the topic that you have is uh, more on what we can do in regards to uh, dealing with courts around this, which is kind of another topic, and I'd like to handle that in another show, if you don't mind. Sure. Sure. Yes? As far as maternal deprivation... have yes, you go heard ahead. of LAS? LAS? Um, LAS. No, I have not heard of this. It's a, the Legal Abuse Syndrome. Karen Yes, Hopper. I just mentioned this. Mm-hmm. Oh, you did? Okay. All right. Yeah, I mentioned then, that because this is something that we also suffer from, right? This is the uh, the narcissism yes. and maternal deprivation that's facilitated by the courts, which Absolutely. is causing us to have a, a, yes, another... It's mm-hmm. maternal deprivation, which causes a trauma. It's a it's it's a injury. It's sort of it's mm-hmm. a it's form of a PTSD. Mm-hmm. Um, this is why some of us commit suicide uh, because of the high trauma all the time. It's not one thing. It's not one time. It's everything all the time. 
and it causes to, people to snap, etc., even kill yep. their own children and themselves, homicide and suicide, or combination of suicide, um, homicide is also very high, especially among men. Because Excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up. And, and, and you know, uh, one of the things we've talked about in previous shows is that the family courts, because they make money off of our cases, they don't want to close the cases and they allow them to dra- drag on and on, which also it drags on and on this legal abuse. Mm-hmm. It is called protruded litigation. It's a tactic. Mm-hmm. If you do not understand or know what they're using against us, is attrition war techniques, which are described in the book Art of War. You just get that book and read. There's 30, 40 um, methods and strategies that they use against us. That's one of them, the protruded litigation. It it des- it's designed to wear you down emotionally, mentally, physically, <clears throat> financially, definitely, because that's every single time... <clears throat> It's not about how much money you paid, physical money, to the lawyers and courts and to file documents, etc. It's about the signature. Every time you put a signature down, they go make money because your signature is your energy. They mm-hmm. go to their banks, their coffer accounts, their crease accounts, their retirement accounts, your account, your trust account, which they administrate which you don't know anything about, um, and they take monies in billions, if not trillions. This is why it's, a, it's in their straight, direct interest to mm-hmm. protrude the litigation and do vexatious litigation as well. Right, right. Yeah, and we'll talk about that uh, whole topic on how to uh, deal with the whole uh, um, the birth certificates and marriage certificates and how all that works, the legal end of this uh, in another show. For right now, I want to bring in our other guests and uh, talk a little bit more about the, um, uh, the effects that maternal deprivation has had on them and how they've been able to cope. Thank you so much, Nadia, for calling in no and problem. bringing that uh-huh. up. It's a great thank point. You. Thank you so much. Thank you for the show. I really enjoy it. Thank you. I hope it helps oh, a lot. Oh, thank much. you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. For your, for your contribution. No, that's not the right way to say it. For your contribution. Sorry, sorry, I'm getting all mixed up, mixed up here. So I'm back here with Susie and Coral, and we were on the topic of narcissism and the great, great, not not yet there. Uh, you know, explaining that the. Use the seniors towards towards there are therefore also contribute to the most traumatic stress and we all suffer from. It, it, just, it just doesn't doesn't end, end the, uh, when our kids are taken take take from us. It, just, it, just, uh, it, it goes on and on and on and on. It takes a long, long time. Court cases. So, do you guys have more input in as to how you both have been dealing with? This post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I know for myself, um, when uh, my daughter was uh, deported and abducted, um, it took me uh, a while to recover. Um, I was very tired. I had no energy. Uh, it really uh, took me a while to figure out how to get back on my feet. Um, like you both, uh, I was financially devastated and uh, I had no money. I was homeless for a while. Um, but I pulled myself together fairly quickly once I realized that the whole purpose of this was for me to become uh, psychologically and emotionally devastated um, as well as financially devastated. And once I realized that that was the purpose, um, I said to myself, well, then I'm going to do the opposite and I'm going to be extremely successful. <laughs> and I'm, do- I'm doing really great now. Uh, um, but uh, I know it's just a process, and I kind of want to uh, ask you both how uh, how you went about this process. How did you uh, recover from this first initial blow of your kids being taken from you and, and, and being homeless and pulling yourself out of that real uh, dark space? So, okay. Go ahead. Um, okay. All right. Well, I would like to say that... Um when it first occurred, um, I think I was in um, shock, denial, and um, 
my PTSD escalated dramatically. Um, but um, what happened was I was fighting so hard on the custody of my children that I was oblivious to everything else. And I, I did not at first realize what was going on in the circus act, in the court. And I went through um, three different lawyers, um, the um, opposing counsel and my ex-husband um, got these lawyers, my lawyers on board with them and they were all acting against me. Um, that's how we got the possession of my children in the first place because my lawyer signed an agreed order with his lawyer giving them custody, giving him custody of my children. And I was not present at that hearing. So I was kind of in shock and I didn't know what to do. And I was on trial because everything was about me that I had a, an unknown mental impairment and I was dangerous to my children and they tried to bring up all kinds of, um, horrific stuff about me stories and um, the other thing I wanted to say was um, my husband and his attorney had seven police officers from two local towns my town and his town we were neighboring towns we butted up against one another um, testify against me I didn't even know most of the officers some of them have like answered answered my call when I locked my um, keys in the car or I got stuck in the ice in my driveway and I called the police. I had a four-wheel drive. I, I did not know how to get it out of the ice and they instructed me how to do it. But, you know, just minimally did I meet these couple officers. They all testified against me. Say, you know, it was like, it was, it was really fascinating. I couldn't believe it. And um, so anyway, my last lawyer was the most honest. He has since been disbarred. And I'm also wondering if it's he has not been disbarred because he did do an excellent job cross-examining the guardian of litem in my case, uh, my ex-husband. I mean, it was obvious that there was a lot of um, a lot of perjury going on. The guardian of litem lied. Everybody covered up. My ex's um, former therapist. When I found the um, images of the little children on our computer. Um, the pornography. Um, he went to therapy. I gave him two years to try to recover. I had gone to my um, parish priest and talked to him. And um, I should have went right to the police, and I didn't. I was covering from him in a, for him in a way. I was in denial. And um, so I gave him this two-year period, but his therapist talked to the guardian litem and to me and said my ex-husband could not get custody of the children. He needed to pass a um, test for sexual interest in children. It's called an ABLE assessment screen. So this occurred, and um, um, after that, after I lost, at the second hearing, I lost permanent sole custody. I lost my job. I couldn't even use the phone. I was devastated. I, was, um, I wasn't I was able to get out of bed. It was terrible. I used to pray that, um, I, I used to pray to the good Lord above that um, I didn't have to face another day. I would not um, take my own life, but I wanted God to do that for me. Well, and, thank you um, for not doing that, Susie, because I can tell I you know. that your experience, uh, I know I've had some really dark moments, and in those dark moments, you've always been there for me, and because you've been through it, uh, it was so important for me to have those conversations with you, because it made me realize, like, uh, you know, you've been through it, and, and that means that I can get through it, too, and this is so right. important for the moms that are listening who are, you know, I, I have had several moms uh, contact me every day from all over the world, and some of them say, oh, you know, I don't want to go on Facebook because I'm afraid I'm going to get stalked or I'm, I'm afraid it's going to get used right. against me in court. And as a result, right. they're very isolated, and I worry about that. And for all those moms who are listening right now and who are afraid to uh, seek support, please uh, let go of that fear because there's thousands of mothers going through this every day. And uh, if you get uh, to hear their stories and, 
and and learn from them how they get through it, then you know you're not alone, and uh, you you know join us in in this uh, in this fight against um, you know our our kids being stolen and learn from us how we are able to uh, get through this and uh, and fight right because it's one thing to be uh, devastated, but it's another thing to actually get up and. Uh, um, you know, get your shit together and then um, uh, actually fight back. Uh, the, there's, there's a two-step right. uh, scenario, right? First, you got to take care of yourself and and uh, be able to survive it all, and then uh, you got to get the energy together to actually um, take matters back in your own hands. So, uh, Coral, for you, for you, how how did you get to go from uh, uh, living out of your car to uh, being able to um, function again in, in in the world? Well, it's um, just been in different stages. I believe everybody's healing has many layers, and I believe all of life is an ongoing journey of healing, where we become more awake, aware, and conscious each day, each month, each year. Um, For me, uh, the greatest gift uh, the first year after the loss of my eight children was meeting Dr. Barbara May, who's a professor of nursing at Linfield College in Portland, Oregon. And she's been my mentor and a friend for 18 years. And she did go to some of the court hearings and filed affidavits um, to no avail, uh, and she has documented my case in Oregon as one of the most obscene and violent domestic violence cases in their history. But uh, just to have a mentor and someone that could hear hear me and believed me, that was a first. And um, she uh, empowered me to write, uh, even asking myself, what does a victim need? to, I don't call it moving on, I say just go, going on. I don't use the word move on. Uh, often we, I think it's, it's impossible in these kind of situations to move on. Mm-hmm. But I, I wrote um, that it, we need to heal and to go on, that we need a place to share our pain and be acknowledged. We need compassion. And we need to know that ourselves and others will be protected from our perpetrators We need accountability, someone to hold the perpetrator accountable. We need restitution and material compensation for the losses incurred by us. We need vindication, not revenge, to be set free. Scars will remain, but healing is sufficient so as not to continue to be held in bondage to the trauma. But I also added, when there is no justice, there is truly no healing. And uh, for me, it was uh, similar to you, uh, the journey. uh, It's just been a spiritual journey in these past 20 years of just understanding the system, the family court systems. And uh, it's, uh, I read a book called Man's Search for Meaning by Victor, Dr. Victor Frankel, who survived Auschwitz concentration camp. I've read many survivors from the Holocaust, their memoirs, and he shared when you understand the how, you can do any why. Anyway, just understanding um, the systems and uh, empowering myself with knowledge, reading a lot of the articles written by people who are articulating this epidemic of protective mothers losing custody of their children to their abusers has helped empower me, has helped heal me. And then just ongoing to my own spiritual journey, that is what has kept me alive. But I do share with everyone, I'm very honest about this, that a huge part of me died in 1996. And that's a part I don't believe will ever be retrieved. And uh, I believe many women who knew me at that time, they wanted nothing more to do with me because I believe it's every woman's nightmare to have their children taken in this way. Um, this is not a loss through death. They are alive. We know where they are. It's like even when I hear of kidnapped um, children being returned to their parents, we are experiencing the same thing, the same loss, but nobody rallies around us, or very few people do. And a lot of my friends said they didn't want to see me anymore because it hurt them too much to see me without my children and babies. So in the meantime, I found that um, meditation... 
and quietness and rest and sleep, music, dance, singing. Um, there's many healing arts such as yoga, Reiki, uh, deep tissue massage, cranial sacral work. There's rapid eye therapy for PTSD. Um, just understanding, just like a mother who's about ready to give birth to a baby, when you understand more of what is going to happen um, while you're going through it, it um, eases the pain. And so for me, yes, understanding um, why I'm going through this, understanding society, understanding why people are helping my abusers, uh, that has empowered me. And that's why, you know, just writing a book and a memoir and documenting everything that went on, I I think a lot of people find it unbelievable. But um, I have pictures, documents, affidavits, court documents. I have a a judge laughing about the rapes that I suffered on court audio tapes. It's outrageous. It's unbelievable that it happened. So part of my healing is empowering myself with knowledge and understanding that the world around me is not what I thought it was. Although I had worked as a court reporter for a couple of years before my marriage, so I was sim- I was familiar with um, court. I used to uh, sit in juvenile court and see young girls be returned to their father who had raped them, you know, within months, and that uh, was incredibly shocking for me. But it's how the system was operating. So part of me was not. Highly surprised, <laughs> but um, uh, I think a lot of us, um, not just protected mothers, but many people fall through the judi- judicial cracks, and uh, mentally ill veterans, domestic violence victims, rape, child abuse, and I tell people that if you really want to know about our justice system, you do not question the judges, police, attorneys, or lawmakers, you go to the victims the unprotected, the vulnerable, those who need the law's protection the most and listen to their stories. Mm-hmm. But I Very find well uh, having, someone, yeah, having someone to believe me, um, Dr. Barbara May, and she was in court and she even heard uh, one of my judges uh, at the time I was homeless and he, I was, I've been my own attorney now for nearly 18 years with no money, so you have to have at least 20000 to retain an attorney so I was there representing myself. I was, I was probably the 30th court hearing, and the judge was yelling at me to go get an attorney. I kept telling him I'm destitute. I'm living out of my car. I cannot get an attorney without money. And he kept telling me to go get an attorney. But it was upsetting him that I didn't have an attorney there. But Dr. Barbara May was there, and it was just it was just an insane moment. But there's been many of those. And for me, um, one mentor told me to hold my arm out and draw a circle. And she says, to survive this you're just going to have to put all those people out there, the perpetrators, the court system. You draw a circle and you just put that there. And then for me, I um, I, I attempt to um, detach it from who I am. They do not define me. It's very sick. It's very twisted. It's horrific. And uh, so that's been the part of my own healing. And there's many ignorant people out there. I find... Um, about the situation. They'll accuse you of either being a criminal, a drug addict, an abuser. Um, They just don't believe this happens, but it's happening in epidemic proportions. And I find going out publicly or just being involved um, socially, people just say things to me that are just incredibly cruel. And uh, so I'm hoping my book and programs like this and other people sharing their stories will help educate those who want to um, become more aware and conscious. But uh, another thing that helps is, yes, just exercise, dance, um, yoga, nutrition. There's health supplements uh, such as fish oil. There's, you know, if you study PTSD, there's many, many things they've found are helpful, um, even aromatherapy. But uh, having a trusted friend, a mentor, uh, that is a huge help in, in your own survival um, I had been betrayed by many people. I even had a friend of 20-some years who uh, at I had asked her not to give my contact information to my abusers. I called her three times in one evening to please not do so. It was the night my mother, my abusive mother passed away, and I said, you know what my abusers do? They'll call people who know me. Please do not give my contact information. And she went ahead and did that. So I think people who are involved in 
these type of ongoing um, uh, survival, uh, it's just expected that people will betray you. And that is um, just adds more to the trauma of life. I can't understand why people do that, but they do. Um, but I, there are many helps out there, and uh, each person's different. Each person needs to, you know, find what works best for them. But um, there are these are the things for me that have helped me. And um, there's many great authors and books. Um, one of my favorite um, articles is um, by Dr. Jack Statton. I believe he works at the Portland University in Portland, Oregon, but he wrote What is Fair for Children of Abusive Men. You can find that at a wonderful uh, site called Liz Library. I also have it posted in my resource section. But um, understanding, I believe the knowledge um, gained from all the people writing and speaking about this is incredibly helpful. And I'll, I'll close. I know, you know, when we're all on social media, we are sharing um, just the incredibly horrific pain of the loss of your children via family courts. And I, I call it psychic shock. It's a shock you really never get over. You wake up with it every day. It doesn't ever go away. Um, I found uh, Melissa Barnett she wrote a beautiful article called Restore um, Our Good Names, The Good Names of Protective Mothers. But it, she said, losing custody of your children is shameful and elicits public condemnation. It is also the symbol of patriarchal ownership that exists still today. The chattel laws of the past are very much alive and the only women who retain custody after divorce are those whose husbands did not fight. When we divorce in the society, we are divorcing the protection of marriage. Like an umbrella, the rights given to men were shared with the wife. Once divorced, we are not protected under the law, and therefore our children are not protected either. Nor do we have a rightful claim to the children we birthed. We are set adrift in the society still clinging to archaic practices. The manipulation and retaliation, the denial and complicit behavior of community, our foundations and patriarchal society where male superiority is king and women who fight back against this rule are punished severely. Mothers desperately, both individually and collectively, need to be vindicated and our good names restored. That is my hope. And I know programs Uh like this will bring awareness. But um, also, I've written, I I think, in healing, um, and depending on your circumstances, I know that there's gag orders out there for me, once I was no longer um, in a position with visitation with my children and I was in ongoing court abuse, that's when I decided that I had no attorney and that my memoir would be a representation for me. Even in the event of my early death, I wanted my children to know what happened and that I loved them. And I found it was um, conflicting that I, I knew um, Life Magazine and U.S. Today and many other magazines have featured articles on women in prison in America, and they report that women prisoners are allowed to keep their babies with them for 18 months while serving their sentences. And I'm just haunted by the single question that why was I treated lower than a criminal by Oregon's judicial law system? And presently, mm-hmm. I really have fewer rights than a criminal in America, and I have no criminal record, and I have no history of alcohol, drug, or child abuse. And I, yep. I find that's that's what's really twisting in being able to survive. But I do say that Lady Justice may be blind, but she should not be mocked. And uh, I will always say that nothing justifies the minimization or removal of a fit and loving parent from a child's life. Nothing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Very well put. I, I do pray for all women that are going through this, and it is it is definitely a club that nobody wants to be inducted into, but it is happening at epidemic rates. And we all need to just be praying for one another and being there for one another. And I find just um, connecting with other women, especially there's several of us that's gone through this for decades. And uh, just to sometimes we just know that we know. We know the pain each of us has carried for this long and that we're still standing on top of all the wounds. But it doesn't really get easier. I share that with people. I, I, I'm sorry to say that. 
but women write me every day and asking me, how have you done this? I'm only in my first or third or fifth year and to have gone to court for 20 years. I will tell them honestly that the pain does not get easier. In fact, as you get older, even with combat veterans, they will, they will confess that too. That often all of the compartments, uh, the mask, uh, I confess to people, I'm very transparent, but the mask that I carry is the one that I'm pretending that I'm not as in much pain as I really am. I mean, to function in society, you put a smile on when you go out the door and it's a mask. I'm pretending that I am, I feel like somebody poured oil on me and set me on fire. That's how I feel every day. And I know every protective mother who's lost her children and babies feels that same way too, whether it be the first day, the first year, or 20 years later. But um, you know, the compartments start to uh, fall down. And, and so I say that um, it's more painful now in a very different way than it was years ago. I just have more knowledge and I have more depth of my own spiritual awareness and journey that's you know, keeps me glued. But um, there's days, you know, you just, you feel incredible grief. And, uh, and yes, that analogy that I believe when you lose your children, it does. It feels like you were, somebody poured oil on you and just set you on fire. And that feeling never goes away. Mhm. Yeah, that's uh that's quite a uh, a good way to describe it. I I I kind of want to add to that too that y- you can't really get to a level of acceptance ever around this. However, you can learn to live with it. Um and then this, this is what I've learned to do uh, also by getting uh knowledge about what's happening, uh why it's happening. Um it's it made me realize, you know what this is uh it's nothing personal even though it's the most personal thing that can happen to you. Um, narcissism is about the narcissist and the system that support, supports the narcissist. However, uh, what it's telling you about yourself is that uh, you're an empath, <laughs> and um, that's actually a great, a wonderful thing. And we should celebrate uh, being empathic people. And um, so one of the ways that I um, are able to cope with my situation, like I said, I can't accept it and I'm fighting back. Uh, and one of the ways I do that is through this radio show. But the way I cope um, is by uh, I work hard. Uh, I'm a college professor and it's a very demanding position that um, makes me have to be uh, available for my students um, five, sometimes six days a week. And it helps me to uh, work with this younger generation. Um, this is a wonderful, um, you know, interaction uh, with these young people that really makes me, uh, gives me a sense of um, value, which is really important. Um, and I, I like the analogy, uh, Coral, that you uh, used of, of drawing this circle around you. It's, it's really important to become aware of your own thoughts and where you uh, draw the line in allowing uh, intrusive thoughts to enter your center, so to speak. So when I notice that I have intrusive thoughts, uh, one of the things that I've been doing is I've tried uh, several different guided meditations um, that have been very helpful in teaching me how to uh, keep these intrusive thoughts uh, at more of a distance. And I wanted to share with the listeners uh, uh, what these guided meditations, um, what they're named. One of them is called Quantum Light Breath. Uh, it's a guided meditation that will help you move through the pain uh, because at the center of the pain is love. And this, it, it's very odd to, to, to think of that, but once you go all the way through the pain, uh, you come to realize that you have the pain because you are capable of so much love. It's almost like, you know, a coin. A coin has two sides and one side is pain and the other side is love. And, you know, when you're in the dark side of love, it, it feels like pain. So once you're able to go all the way through it to the center of it and touch the core of it and you realize that you feel that pain because you are capable of an incredible amount of love, 
it's very healing. At least it was for me to experience that. It was very, very healing. I realized, okay, um, the essence is all pure love. And the fact that it doesn't necessarily um, get um, reflected back in this earth time dimension doesn't mean that it's gone and this is yeah. extremely comforting at least it was for me to uh it made me realize um i might feel shattered but actually in essence i am whole and that love cannot be hurt it cannot be destroyed it cannot be harmed it's always there yes go ahead Oh, I was going to share at the, um, my book is available for free at my website, but at the very end, I do share my spiritual journey. There's not enough time in these radio shows, but there is a chapter, I put it separate from my memoir, but just from the beginning and, and just um, my own spiritual journey of um, coming from a place of, you know, just even as a child, I was sex trafficked for years by my own mother. Um, within the family and uh, coming to a place of, yes, there is a place you can have wholeness even in the midst of a lot of shattering and ongoing abuse. So I did share um, in my memoir and wrote just that journey. Yeah, it's very important. Another one of those meditations has been, um, and I, I, I'm not sure if this is available in the United States, but it's very popular here in the Netherlands. It's called Siberian Trance Meditation, uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of like a vision quest, a type, a Native American Indian type of vision quest, um, the way of healing um, that I also found tremendously helpful. Uh, and, of course, any type of uh, cognitive therapy, uh, talk therapy with a trauma specialist is very uh, right, helpful right. as well. And uh, yes, you mentioned uh, a, a rapid eye movement um, yes. therapy, e EMDR it's also called. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. this yeah. can also and be also helpful. I might want to note, um, as you're talking about therapists, and I, I post, I have a um, Bonshia Making Light of the Dark Facebook page, but there is... Um, an, uh, there are therapists who are dangerous and not safe, and you will find that out as you proceed. You don't know that, um, but with each person, I, I tell everybody to proceed with caution. Um, you know, for many of us, we have found eventually safe uh, counselors, but I, I had a therapist who broke all the laws of confidentiality and brought in people who were predators and one of them robbed me and stopped and threatened me and eventually broke in my apartment and attempted to murder me. I live under an address protection program from that person too now, but um, it was very shocking, wow. and the or Oregon Medical Board found nothing wrong with that. Um, I reported mm -hmm. even my own mentor, or doctor, it's Dr. Charles Kuttner, admitted what he did, and uh, it's after the laws in 1993 of confidentiality, con confidentiality laws. But I'm just sharing that um, I that was one of my first experiences within the year after I lost my children, that when you have a trusted physician and that's all you have in life, your family, everybody is not um, safe. And, and then you have someone like that that betrays you while you're attempting to put your pieces together. It's incredible exploitation and abuse. And so I just share with people, um, proceed with caution. There's a lot of articles out there on patients' rights. Um, that's good to know. But there are some incredibly good uh, trauma counselors and therapists. And like I say, I think from all of us, we really appreciate Judith Herman, her book, Trauma and Recovery, a profound book. But um, w would it be correct to mention a few sites that are helpful within the movement? Um, there's a few that yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah. th just to, 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 for our guests as well, like I know that from my own experience with post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome, when I first uh, experienced um, what that felt like after the abduction, I couldn't read. I don't know about you guys, but I, c I couldn't read. Right. I was, my mind was so, you know, overwhelmed. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, some all, people uh, can't talk. Uh, it took me right. a few years to be able. I had so much trauma to take care of on a daily basis, just finding work. Um, I ended up working at a warehouse the first year, which my health couldn't even sustain. But um, doing court, seeing my children being abused by my ex-husband on visitation, um, more court work, working eighty-hour work weeks, um, 
just attempting to live and survive that that I, I couldn't talk about the trauma yet. It took a couple years. I was just busy attempting to be alive. And uh, I was going to so mention are, a few sites are, um, that, yeah, right. that have helped. I just, I just wanted to mention that this is really helpful for for those of us who, uh, you know, those mothers that are listening and think, oh, my God, I can't do all that reading and talking. So it's okay. You know, it's okay if you if you need time time to get to that point. Okay, we're not telling you, like, go out and do all this stuff. It's like, no, we just know that there are ways to learn uh, coping skills. Um, And it doesn't mean you're going to uh, be able to accept it. It doesn't mean it's going to get easier. It doesn't mean that you're going to ever accept any of this. It just means that you learn uh, to deal with it so you can um, stay strong because one day your children might very well come back to you. And at that point, it is important that they don't find uh, a mom who is completely broken and shattered. At that point, it is important that you have the coping skills to teach them how to deal with feelings of powerlessness or lack of self-confidence due to the abuse, the trauma they've suffered, right? We, We are eventually going to be in a role of helping our children deal with what has happened to them through the system and through their fathers. So we must be a uh, a guiding light for them. And and as such, use this time that you are uh, not with your children to become really strong and to learn these coping skills so you can be that mentor for your own children once they come back to you. That would be my message. Um, Now, Susie, for for you, uh, what has been helpful for you in dealing with, um, with, with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, any types of well, kind of therapy that you've done? Yeah, or? yes, yes, and Sarah kind of broke up there a little bit. Um, it's just still very emotional, and it's been seven years for me now, but um, I wrote. I used to be an avid reader. I used to love music. There was always dancing in my house. The kids were dancing. We listened to music. Everything stopped. Everything halted. I still don't read, and I still don't listen to music. Um, But I wrote, and it was very therapeutic for me. Um, And then when I got into this transitional um, living situation, and I started going to therapy for the PTSD and the depression every day, the intensive therapy really, really helped. And basically what I did in every group and with every therapist was I kept telling my story over and over and over again. And I used to come in to my sessions with like the medical record of my daughter's abuse, things like that to to prove to them that this happened. And they've told me over and over, and I finally now get it, you don't have to prove anything. We believe you because no one believed me. And I too, like um, Crow was mentioning and you were mentioning Gertie, um, I had no friends left, no one. Everyone abandoned us. No one wanted anything more to do with us. Um, So I was pretty much alone in it until I found this program in 2013. And then I also found all the support networks um, like this, your radio show, um, um, Safety Even Facebook, International. Right. Yeah, Facebook, yeah, even, Facebook. Yeah, yeah. The, the support of mothers that are on Facebook, yes. But I was alone in it, and um, for a long time I blamed myself. But um, I don't do that today any longer, and I realize, um, I realize what happened. I, I, I understand the corruption, the human rights violations. And um, so um, going to school and finding a focus for my own life and a goal has really helped me a lot. And um, Yes. Mm-hmm. 
Right. Yeah, it's right. really important so, to realize we are we are more than just protective mothers. <laughs> That's really important right. to realize. It, it took me a while to get that. It's like, oh yeah, we have a right to also um, enjoy things in life. <laughs> I mean, right. really seriously, uh-huh. the pain can get so overwhelming that you kind of forget. Like, oh yeah, there's other things exactly. going on in life as well. We can also yeah. go hiking in nature and really enjoy a, a beautiful day or a beautiful sunset. And even if you all, if you have a really bad day and it's just uh, uh, three seconds of, of experiencing a beautiful sunset, then then take that experience and put it in your pocket, so to speak, right, as, as uh, the gem of the day. That's how I look at it. It's like I, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, I kind of look back and I say, these and these and these moments were beautiful or were good. And I, I really put that out there um, for myself because to, to, to mm-hmm. set it off against all the other negative stuff that's happening. And I also wanted to mention right. Um, making sure that you take very good care of your body. Make sure you get enough sleep. Make sure that you get enough um, special vitamins, such as adrenal support vitamins, uh, supplements. Um, one thing that's helped me a lot is the Ayurvedic herb ashwagandha. Uh, you can Google that. Ashwagandha mm-hmm. it really helps strengthen the system. Mm-hmm. It gives you more energy. If, if you really feel like you can't get out of bed or you can't go to the store to, to go grocery shopping, you can't take care of yourself, make sure that you take extra supplements. Um, vitamin B, uh, you know, multiple vitamin Bs, uh, that really helps as well. Some people are helped with antidepressants or or St. John's word can also be um, very helpful in this regard, you know? So I take um, medication as well. And that, that helps tremendously. Right. There's people that say uh, uh, people use Ativan or other type of, uh, um, you know, medications to help calm you down or or allow you to go to sleep. You know, as long as you uh, don't uh, develop a tolerance uh, to those medications, then that can also be very helpful. I'm I'm purely uh, about homeopathics. And uh, I also use Bach Remedy. I don't know if you uh, know the Bach Mm. Remedy, uh, sweet chestnut that helps if you have intense grief. You know, if you have this incredible grief that you can't stop crying, if, if you take 10 drops of the Bach Remedy, sweet chestnut, I'll tell you, it's amazing. Within like 30 seconds to a minute, um, it will go away. If you have anger issues because of the feeling that you, you know, of the feeling of powerlessness, then take Bach Remedy Cherry Plum. Cherry Plum mm. really helps with anger and with, uh, you know, when you just feel so powerless. Yeah, so these are things that have helped me. Um, any type of supplements that, that you both can recommend for our listeners? Um, for me, uh, fish oil and vitamin D were two that you didn't mention, but I, I know those are very helpful for um, trauma survivors. Fish oil and vitamin D. Okay. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm and I take, to um, <laughs> just take a multiple vitamin today along with D, a lot of vitamin C. For my immune system and um you know i just beat myself up in my body i used to stay awake for um many nights writing and writing and writing and i i go to sleep at the same time every night i get up at the same time every day i eat my meals at the same time every day i just there was no order or um anything to my life in the past and now i do all these things on a regular basis and um you know, I have energy, I feel better. So. Yeah, that's very helpful. So a sense of uh, making, creating a rhythm in your life uh, is really important. Yeah. So really, yeah. Uh, after listening to the both of you and having this conversation with the both of you, uh, it just come to, it's just come to my mind that really we need um, some type of support centers where we can go when this happens to us. And uh, I'm flabbergasted that this is happening to thousands and thousands of moms all across the world. And there's no... And, 
no type of place, an actual physical location where we can go to, uh, where we can get help, uh, not just with the psychological aspects or the physical aspects of the trauma that we're going through, but also uh, where it should be a place where we also get help, um, get our lives together financially again, uh, get help with possible jobs or uh, uh, education, uh, financial support. Um, we really, uh, and this is kind of um, what I'm throwing out there to the listeners, uh, people who are thinking along with us, uh, we need this type of help. We, we really do need a place where we can go, where we can get a, multi, a multidisciplinary team to, to help us get back on our feet, uh, not just for ourselves, but for the children as well once they come back. So we, you know, we are together and strong to, in order to help them, uh, like I said before. Um, these tips that we're throwing out right now, um, we're, we're doing that because we have experienced this. We're kind of like the pioneers in that sense, and, and, and definitely the both of you uh, are pioneers because you are veterans, um, like I said in the introduction, you're veterans in all of this. And I learned from you, and, and what I learned from you, I pass on to other people. And in this way, I hope it's helpful, but, you know, we really need professional um guidance and help in all of this and on a, on a continuing basis you know i know one mom that has her children back <clears throat> now but she's dealing with the fallouts for her children and for herself and that's very traumatic as well there's a lot of healing that needs to be done and it will probably take a lifetime for us as mothers and uh for our children as well so I want to I want to thank you both uh, for sharing your stories. I I, I know it's thank um, you for having us on. Oh, you're welcome. I have, one, thank you. I, I have one quote just to end the program with. It's it's not just for mothers of lost children, but for society, for our courts. Mm-hmm. Um, my favorite quote that I wrote in my own memoir is forcibly taking a mother's children and then controlling her emotionally by withholding contact must be publicly recognized as one of the greatest forms of misuse of the American justice system and one of the greatest hidden vehicles for widespread socially approved physical and emotional abuse and control. Amen. Well, that's a a beautiful way to end our show. Thank you both for being on. Thank you for your courage to to share your stories. I I hope it was helpful to all the listeners, and I hope you will tune in again uh, next week uh, for another episode of Hell is for Children. Um, And that concludes this show. Thank you all, and bye-bye.